Welcome to the Law Society Younger Members Committee Career Information Session number two, when Jennifer Dorgan speaks to Ken Murphy about the solicitor's profession, past, present and future. joining us. Thank you. Um, my name is Jennifer. I am a member of the Younger Members Committee and I am joined by our Director General Ken Murphy who is going to speak to us on the past, present and future of the profession. So hi Ken, thank you for joining us. Thank you. And that's a, it's a very narrow theme. I don't know how I can you know, get any value out of past, present and future. I mean, what, what, anyway, I came up with it myself. And um, those of you who know me um, um, will know that Jennifer's only uh, uh, role here uh, today, and we went. We had a little rehearsal earlier. Is uh, not to get me started, but to get me stopped. So um, <laughs> you, I will, I, I will wait for Jennifer's intervention when I've gone on too long, and I will at that stage cease. But really, um, it is a huge pleasure for me, and I was thrilled, genuinely delighted to be invited to talk to this group this evening because, um, although it may not look it now, I am a former younger member myself. Um, there's a great uh, David Cameron line where he says uh, when he was outgoing as Prime Minister of England, you know, I was once the future. Um, and it's a, uh, it is a, sorry, oh, I, I see the president has just texted me to say he's listening in. Hi, James. Um, <laughs> but uh, thank you uh, for everyone who's listening in. Um, it, it is a, um, uh, so, I mean, the very first role, I'm, I'm, I'm looking back, I'm going to go backwards to the present and I am going to look to the future because the future mm -hmm. is far more relevant for you guys because I'm at this stage past but 40 years ago 4-0 40 years ago and uh, this year I qualified as a solicitor and uh, in the latter part of the year I was invited by the then chair of the um, younger members committee Claire Canellan to sit on the younger members committee so my involvement at the law society literally goes back four decades at this stage two years after that uh, at the age of 27 I was uh, elected to the Council of the Law Society. It's pretty rare uh, then or since. Very few people at that age would be elected, really only one or two other than me. Um, and I then got re-elected uh, 12 times to the council because in those days there were annual elections to the council. Um, but for most of the period that I was on the council, a lot of the period, I was the youngest member of the council by far. Um, and um, part of that period, I was actually held the distinguished chair and office that uh, you hold now, Jennifer, the chair of the Younger Members Committee. Um, it's Avril now. I was last year. Avril Flannery this oh, year. Oh, really? And Avril, well then, you are, you, well then surely your next step has to be the Law Society Council. I mean, there's a, oh, distinguished, we'll see, family, yeah. <laughs> there's a distinguished family path to be followed there. Um, but um, in any case, so Younger Members Committee, election to the Law Society Council, and um, 12 years in the council. Uh, in that period, in practice, I was a practitioner uh, when I qualified originally in Hickey, Beecham, Curran and O'Reilly, uh, I was apprentice to John F. Buckley, who was a luminary of the, of the profession then uh, uh, and a great hero and mentor of mine. Um, and when I qualified, I practiced for in conveyancing for a year and a half in residential and commercial conveyancing. Um, didn't really, um, it wasn't where I wanted to end up. Um, and I saw it was a job advertised um, uh, in, in a box office number, as they tend to be in those days. And it turned out to be um, uh, a, uh, a Protestant firm on, on Fitzwilliam Square called A&L Goodbody that I'd had no dealings with previously. I went in, I'm told there were 70 applicants for the job, but I told the interviewer um, about my passion for cricket, at least I feigned one because there's a certain amount of, of, um, of uh, allowable hyperbole in any interview, I think. Um, and I'd paid cricket once, um, but Marcus Beresford, it turned out, was a big cricket nut. And I think mainly on the basis of that, anyway, after several interviews, um, I was uh, appointed and I, and I worked happily with him in the litigation department for about five years. The firm then in 1988, in its wisdom, looking around, it was a, in a very internationally orientated firm then as now, it had a, an office in New York since the 1970s, decided at the same partners me, I wasn't a partner then, but they, at the same partners meeting, decided to open offices in both London and Brussels. Uh, the great James Osborne, the managing partner with the vision, and I was told the following day that um, my name had been mentioned in this regard and they were hoping that I would go to Brussels to establish the office there, which I did. Um, so went, uh, spent four years, went for two years, stayed for four, 
uh, was married, first two kids were born in Brussels, um, and uh, ended up really as a specialist in European and competition law. Um, the Competition Act of 1991 was just coming on stream and the same principles as, as, as EU law, uh, EU competition law. Came back, uh, was a partner in the commercial, I was at that stage a partner in the firm in the commercial department, you know, you know good body. Um, and then out of the blue, but all the time I stayed involved with the council, the politics of the council. And out of the blue in late 1994, my predecessor in office named Noel Ryan decided he was going to resign as Director General of the Royal Society and go off and, and, and join Chief Executive role in the Irish Horse Racing Authority. And it just struck me, wouldn't that be interesting? I hadn't the notion in my life of ever becoming Director General of the Law Society, but I'd been a council member. Um, and I just thought it would be interesting. Um, and anyway, to cut a long story short, applied for, appointed, and 26 years later, um, I am about to leave that office now, having spent in total close on 40 years involvement with the Law Society. I would encourage everybody listening, if they're not already, well, I don't have to encourage James Cappell, for example, but I, anybody else who's listening who is not involved in the Law Society, I would involve them, I encourage them to do so. Get involved in the committee, obviously, initially, um, and then possibly think of the council. The politics of the profession are interesting, obviously, particular personality types, but I think that anyone who serves in law society committees benefits from it. They benefit in terms of their insight into the profession and they benefit as practitioners. You become, you become a better lawyer um, by doing this. Uh, and it helps your career. Many people would find that as well, but I would unreservedly encourage people to do so as I, as I finally depart. Um, so, but in terms of, um, that's past, what about the, um, uh, the, the future, uh, the present, um, I would say, um, and I'm going to focus a little bit on the future because we were talking earlier and I have themes and I've, I've, I've given, uh, talked on this theme uh, uh, many times and some of you may have heard it already and so I apologize. But the profession currently, the solicitor's profession in Ireland, when I joined uh, as Director General of the Law Society, there were about 5,000 solicitors on the road. There are now over 22,000 22, solicitors on the road. And there has been an enormous expansion of practice in Ireland. It really is a transformed profession. Um, the, and the driving force in many respects, the, the big growth areas in transformational terms in practice have been two. There's first of, uh, I will talk about corporate and in-house. Um, the corporate and in-house sector and public sector um, part of the profession. Now, just about 20% of all the practicing certificates issued by the Law Society of Ireland every year are now corporate and in-house. That is completely different when I first joined the profession back in the 80s. Um, it, was, it was a tiny number of people would work in-house and really it, was, it wasn't held in terribly high regard. Now, some of the best lawyers in the profession, some of the best lawyers in the profession are working corporate and in-house. Um, interestingly, because I, I, I like the stats about the profession, I looked at the, the figures about two years ago um, on another theme I'm going to raise in a moment, which is gender in the profession, 68% uh, of the PC holders in the profession, in the corporate and in-house public sector section of the profession were women. That is at a time when just over 50%, 51, 52% are women, but six, so, you know, go figure. Um, but that is, that is, that's, that, that's a significant um, statistic. Um, the other great change in the profession, um, the move away from general practice, which would have been utterly predominant when I was qualifying. Uh, I was with a now good body, what a relatively small number of firms that, that focused exclusively on, on commercial business and on international business. But that area has boomed. Um, it is the growth of what's known in America, probably known around the world as big law. Big law is a product of globalization. Globalization has been a phenomenon of the last 30 years, 40 years, it depends on when you could say since the Second World War, but the, the extent to which massive multinational corporations now uh, are hugely dominant in economic terms and economic activity all over the world with intricate supply chains and, and, and capacities to deliver in, in any part of the world where they can make money. Those are, that is one of the uh, big changes of our, of, our to of our era, of our generation or the previous generations and the legal profession has followed it, been very closely connected with it. So much so that now there's huge international law firms 
when I was in Brussels um, in, in 88 to 92, there were about 100 uh, non-Belgian law firms had offices in Brussels. But that was a sign even then of the extent to which big, U, uh, big US firms, big UK firms, City of London firms, Magic Circle firms and so on were establishing there. We're seeing some signs of it now, even in Dublin, where you've got global behemoths like uh, DLA Piper, fourth mm -hmm. biggest law firm in the world, um, and, 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 and others are, are I'm not going to start going through them, Pits and Masons and so on, but big international law firms are now establishing offices in Dublin. Um, and you know, we're, we're, we're hearing all the time of, 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 uh, of, of that kind of uh, operation taking place. So going back over big developments in the profession, the rise of the GC, general counsel, the in-house of public sector, and now in-house in, in major international corporations with numbers of lawyers by the dozen, bigger than law firms, uh, you know, traditional law firms, um, and then the big international law firms. One of the, a partner in one of the largest of the Irish firms told me a few years ago that close between 70 and 80% of the firm's income comes from outside Ireland. Very, very focused on, on international work. And they're following, they're doing extremely sophisticated international legal work. You'd have seen the figures we published an article in the current issue of the Gazette. I do this every year, and this will be my last year doing it. We we'll publish a table of the 20 largest firms. It happens to be Matheson this year. Uh, but the, the numbers, it's, um, it's 323, some very substantial number of, uh, yes, it's um, 327 practicing students in Matson now. Um, so those are the big structural changes in the profession. Yet, general practice, small firm general practice continues to operate very successfully and in some respects to thrive. Now, we're obviously in unusual economic times at the moment, but up to, say, a year ago, when the pandemic hit, um, even small firms were, you know, the smallest firm, the sole proprietor firms, those firms in Ireland are also, you know, um, ubiquitous and obviously can't, can't make a statement of true of, of every one of those firms, but on the general, but these are the firms that serve the public. And that is an absolutely vital role. You can't just serve business and the economy. You have to serve the public, the people, the citizens of the country, and their access to justice, their access to legal services, you know, property transfers, personal injury litigation. I'm not, I won't go down that whole theme, but also, you know, criminal defense work is, is in many respects the legal profession at its most iconic, you know, standing yeah. in the gap between the overwhelming power of the state, the relative powerlessness of the individual, with just the law and the legal principles and the ethical principles that um, that have to be applied. So in terms of that, those are the changes that have taken place. Where is the future going? There are three themes again. There's a guy named David Wilkins, Professor David Wilkins, who's a professor in, in Harvard uh, Law School. Uh, I've uh, met him a few times. Uh, I've been to um, that's talks he's given in Harvard Law School on, and his his role, his theme is um, is uh, his special subject. He's a tenured professor in Harvard Law School. His tenure, his special subject is the legal profession. Not an area of law, not an area of substantive, but the legal profession. And he, he writes very interestingly on it. And the themes that he's been talking about, the three biggest themes, there are all sorts of sub-themes as well, in terms of the big changes of the profession are globalization, um, the rise of the in-house um, practitioner and, and in-house, uh, the general counsel, you know, the in-house practice, which is a rebalancing of power in the profession. Because when I was initially in practice, in the large firms would basically dictate to their corporate clients how what legal services would be delivered and how they'd be delivered. That that balance has been has been changed. So now the major corporates now dictate to the law firms what legal services would be delivered and how they'd be delivered and at what cost. The never-ending tension on, on that issue. And a, a proper tension, there should always be a tension of that kind. Um, but the other great theme that he talked about was the feminization of the profession. That's his term, the feminization of the legal profession. Again, this is a global phenomenon. Um, but as I was saying to, uh, to Jennifer early today, it is um, the, the, I was following this, I'm heavily involved in the International Bar Association and various officer roles and so on there and have for years been involved in international activities networks of chief executives and law societies all over the world. I've led, led those over many years. And I was at a conference, speaking at a conference in Cape Town in 2014, I remember. 
And we had the chief executives of law societies, bars and law societies from 90 different jurisdictions all over the world. And I put the question in an open forum there about women in the profession. What, how many of them, even though everybody talked about, oh, women are, you know, the great majority of the intake are women and, and so on. But, you know, what, how is the balance going? And I was able to identify without doubt in my mind that Ireland was ahead of the curve on this in terms of women in the profession. And in late 2014, because I was following this, uh, the IT department in the Law Society giving me almost daily reports so that I would know when officially, when officially it became the case that the solicitor's profession in Ireland, in practitioner number, was majority women, 50% plus one. And we were the first in the world to achieve that. And uh, as my, my good friend, um, uh, Noretta Smith of the Norwegian Bar Association, and she and I have been co-chair of, of IBA committees, um, and we always think of Norway and the Scandinavian countries as so progressive and they'd be ahead of us and all this sort of thing. At the time, when we were 50% plus one women practitioners here, the number of women practitioners in Norway was 38%. So we were way ahead of, of that curve, but this is a global phenomenon um, as well. The other great global phenomenon uh, and key to the future of the profession is and I know that somebody said, well, what about maybe a question should be asked to him about Richard Susskind. Um, now, uh, Jennifer, I hope you back me up when I say that as you said that to me about two o'clock in our rehearsal meeting today, it took me about two steps to walk across <laughs> the room and to produce this. This is Susskind's, uh, Richard and Daniel Susskind, The Future of the Professions. It's about uh, um, uh, 400 pages. Uh, and I have all his other books as well. I've auto, I mean, his autographed one is um, uh, The End of Lawyers, question mark. He always says it's a provocative title, The <laughs> End of Lawyers, question mark. But he is the great guru on technology and the future of the profession. Um, in in um, 1996, um, uh, Michael O'Mahony brought me down to something in McCann Fitzgerald. And they had this guy that I've never heard of before, Professor Richard Susskind, an uh, Oxford professor talking to them about technology in the future. So McCann's were ahead, you know, were aware of it then. And I've got to know Richard quite well since we've shared taxis in various cities around the world, but he, is, he has been a, uh, he is a great um, expert and, and speaker on this. So we've, we've shared platforms as well. And I've, ha I've ha brought him to Ireland to speak at something I was organizing here. Um, but he has a great phrase from the, this book. This is a, uh, a conference um, in, uh, in Sydney, Australia. Uh, rise of the robots will artificial intelligence make lawyers obsolete and i wrote the, the intro to it um about the the, co the consequences of emerging legal technologies so the emerging legal technologies and this in many respects is the key to the future i think maybe for the world in general but certainly for the legal profession and i just listed here artificial intelligence big data predictive analytics machine learning blockchain document automation chatbots and digital courts um, and these, these are the themes that are, you know, I can tell you the International Bar Association, there are committees who are looking at this. There was a very interesting, at the same session in Sydney, there was an interesting topic for discussion, which was, can robots be lawyers? Question mark. And do ethical principles apply to robots if they are doing what we would traditionally have seen as legal work? And the growth of artificial intelligence, the, the ability of machine learning whereby um, the technology can do things better than you know each time it, they do it, just like human learning, um, and also can develop um, things which it can't, you know, which it, which was never programmed to do because it because it's so it has that capacity. Anyway, Susskind talks about the um, um, and again, I'm quoting from his book here. But most people, layer professional, think of the application of expertise to everyday problems. They tend to assume that human beings need to be directly involved. I'm being a bit provocative now here, Jerry. You know, <laughs> yeah, I'm winding you up a little bit, but this is a great <laughs> man who's talking. Yeah. Then, for example, if it's a medical, legal, or tax issue, then um, flesh and blood advisor is required. Um, as we expect some kind of human interpretive process. But he says, we are seeing signs of the emergence of a radically different approach to the application of knowledge to problems, one which does not directly involve human beings. This is when practical expertise become in, becomes embedded in our machines, systems, processes, working practices, and regular daily activities. 
you should all give up and become computers. No, I'm only joking. But I'm just saying that that is, you know, the um, surfing the digital wave is certainly one of the ways of the future. And you, particularly to the extent to which I'm addressing a younger audience here, you have that advantage. I know my own kids clearly have the advantage over me in this. Uh, I'm, you know, coming late to it, struggle with it a little bit, not a digital native. They are digital natives. You, most of the audience that I presume I'm addressing here are probably digital natives. And you have that capacity to carry the future with you in, in, in those terms. So those are, I don't know how much time more, uh, Jennifer, you want from me, but I've just, I've just you know, raised a number of themes, mm -hmm. big picture themes about the profession. I think one of the great capacities, I think the legal profession in Ireland, let, let's forget about machine learning. Let's think yeah. about, Conveyancing, probation, you know, personal injury litigation, and, and and so on. What are the what are the challenges facing us at the moment? Um, one of them certainly is legal costs. Uh, yeah. Another across the room over there, I have a copy of the five hundred page uh, report on civil on the on civil justice of reform of civil justice, uh, chaired by Mr. Justice Peter Kelly, published there in November. And one of the themes, the one that the media are most interested in, there's a lot of reform of civil justice. Uh, it's very stimulating. It's very well written, actually, it repays a read. And I'm nerdy enough to have read almost all of the 500 pages. But one of the themes, which was controversial within the working group that produced it, and they're also represented by Stuart Gilhooley on that working group, chaired by Peter Kelly. Um, one of the themes is the cost of litigation. I see in on the Irish Times online today, uh, Michael Toomey, Mr. Justice Michael Toomey, who again I knew in my good body's days, now a High Court judge, and he had a he is a bit of a, a go at the fact that um, the amount, the cost, legal cost in certain matters, even substantial matters, can be disproportionate to the value mm -hmm. of the subject matter in dispute. Um, there's no denying, uh, Minister, um, uh, uh, the current Minister for Justice, uh, Helen McEntee, is there at the Department of Justice, and I was talking to the Department of Justice as recently as last week about this, they are moving forward on this. This is part of the, of the department's program is to look at the cost of litigation and um, how can it be, in their view, uh, restrained? Um, because um, it is, that, all I'm saying is the, um, as I, I jokingly say from time to time, but I think there's some truth in the joke. Um, lawyers have no difficulty um, justifying the cost of, of legal services. They perfectly justified in the minds of lawyers. Mm. Nobody outside of the legal profession thinks they're justified. Nobody does. They pay them reluctantly, uh, and yeah. they, they and they uh, and it is the subject of constant criticism and lawyer jokes and so on about. So it is a, but this is a perennial thing. And again, I say it's not not um, simply a subject of dispute in Ireland. It's also you know all all sorts of other, other countries as well. Um, but legal costs will always be, it's a perennial issue. Um, um, and, you know, there's a, uh, that is an issue. Personal injury litigation, you know, there's more reform taking place in England. Reform in inverted commas. Reform, I always think is a loaded word. Reform is a, a change that I favor is a reform. Not necessarily, of course, these are all changes. But if, if they're called reforms, then it's very hard, much harder to resist them, even if we don't like them. Um, so personal injury litigation, um, as we know, the judiciary at the moment are having, from, from my feedback, from talking to one or two judges, some very interesting internal debates taking place within the Judicial Council at the moment on the subject of levels of awards for personal injury litigation by how much, if at all in principle, they should be, they should be cut. But that is a campaign that's been going on throughout my entire 26 years as Director General um, and, and will go on, I'm sure, you know, into the future. There is there is natural tension between um, uh, between the the public. The, the, the real problem is the majority of the public view themselves not as potential accident victims and claimants in personal injuries. The majority of the public view themselves as insurance premium payers. Okay. That's where they see their interest, not in terms of levels of awards or compensation. They see their interest lying in the suppression. For it's and that's uh, and as. Um, the last meeting I had uh, with um, Minister Sean Fleming that uh, James Cahill and Laura Durbin and I were meeting this afternoon, the last meeting I had with them was in November with Stuart Hoodie and we were talking about the cost of insurance. So in terms of 
Um, I saw a question came up on the screen there, the only one I've seen, saying, um, how can young lawyers future-proof themselves? Future-proof, yeah. I think keep learning. Always keep learning. Never stand still. Do new stuff. Um, I, I, a piece of advice I give to newly qualified lawyers everywhere, you know, I've always done, because uh, I believe it is, um, don't specialize too early. Um, mm -hmm. I think you could end up specializing in something that it turns out you don't much like. Uh, and there's nothing worse than being involved in an area of law that you don't much like. And secondly, um, uh, it could turn out that there's no actual big future for that particular area of specialization. I think you should try and, you know, try and do as many different things as you can. Keep your skills, keep your learning up to date, take every course you can, do diplomas, do law society, do your CPD, do double the CPD if you possibly can, you know, in terms of minimum requirements. That's the best way to future-proof yourself and keep your fingers adept at the technology because in many ways, the technology is going to, uh, is going to carry the future for us all. I'm looking, oh, what's your opinion on the possible merger of solicitors and barristers into one profession uh, from Patricia Planning in there? Um, it's not going to happen. Um, I was uh, involved in the competition authority study that produced the report in 2006 on that. The recommendation, um, it didn't recommend fusion of the two branches of the profession. It simply recommended another study to be done on it. The Clementi reforms in England and Wales, mo most parts of the world don't have the traditional common law division that we have into barristers and solicitors. And if you were designing a legal profession from scratch now, you probably wouldn't do it. But there's, there's centuries of tradition behind it. And ultimately, and the argument, I remember, you know, when I'm pressed on Morning Ireland or something in the past, I remember Colin McWillis saying, surely it's just duplication. But the answer to that is it's only duplication if solicitors and barristers are doing the same thing. But if they are performing different roles, different roles within the litigation process, it's not duplication. Um, I think if there was to be, um, um, you know, fusion as the traditional term of, of two branches of the profession, um, then it would be effectively a takeover rather than a merger because the solicitor profession is disproportionately much bigger. 80% plus of the practicing lawyers, 85% of the practicing lawyers in the country are solicitors, the balance are barristers. But the law society policy position, and my personal view is that the independent referral bar does um, uh, form play an important role and also particularly for smaller practices who can't develop in-house the overhead of specialist expertise. What about older solicitors I'm reading here, qualified 1999? General, you still got that? That disappeared off the screen before I could see it. Oh, um, let me just check. Um, older solicitors, oh, well, you know, to my mind, the solicitor qualified in 1999 is not an older solicitor, but anyway, that just shows how old I am. Um, I think Question, Ken, just on an older solicitor, an older solicitor trying to break, they've taken a break from the legal profession, they're trying to break back into the legal arena. I think there is still, I, I'm a great, um, um, you know, believer that there is the, uh, you know, the economy, well, who knows in terms of, you know, COVID and the economy, and there's a certain amount of, a little bit of stasis, even a little bit of paralysis there at the moment, things aren't moving all that much. Uh, people are waiting, basically, for, um, for the vaccine to release us from lockdown and to, and to release them. But I think there's a good reason to believe, I'm not an economist, but I read econom economists, um, there's good reason to believe that there's a lot of pent up demand in the economy. There's a lot of pent up wealth in the economy, which has not been given an opportunity uh, for an outlet over the last year or so. And that, you know, other economists may have a different view, but I'm inclined, I'm inclined to be an optimist. I'm inclined to think that actually there are going to be plenty of opportunities for lawyers. Because one of the things, even beyond just Ireland and, and, and current economic conditions, one of the great strengths of the legal profession, as I've said in many an interview over the years, and I'm coming, my, my interviews are coming to an end now, this may be one of my last, but uh, is that despite its reputation for conservatism, the legal profession actually adapts very well to change. That is one of the reasons why it continues to thrive and succeed throughout the world and, and has done so throughout history. We actually adapt very well to change and whatever changes come, provided you adapt to them, you will, you will perform, I think, yeah, you know, you'll carry the future with you. Um, I'm, wait, I'm waiting for the signal from you, Jer Jennifer. Yeah, Jennifer yeah, I think stop, we might have to but... leave it there, but I think we might have to come back for a part two sometime <laughs> if you're able for the future. Well, I'll have more time in my hand. Us. 
Um, Ken, thank you so much for joining us and I hope you enjoy a very well-deserved break in your well, retirement. I have to say it's been a huge pleasure for me to talk to the Younger Members Committee and, and even some of the not-so-younger members of the profession. Uh, this is one of my last times addressing the profession as a whole, um, or you know, quite a substantial part of it. Uh, it's been a pleasure to do so. And um, but bear in mind what I said: in get engaged, get involved um, in in professional networks, in professional bodies, um, because your local bar association, you know, these are ways in which you will develop as a lawyer, and the future, I truly believe, is bright. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Ken. <laughs>